We are going to talk about Lord Rama. Today is Ram Navami. Uh, the word Navami means um, the ninth, feminine word ninth. It refers to the ninth Titi, the ninth lunar day of the lunar month. And today is Rama Navami. So um, there's a few points, of many of course, about Lord Rama, which I thought were very important and interesting. I mean, there's endless points, but I, I picked a few. And that is, um, first of all, Lord Rama, who of course came to save the world, just like we are trying to be Krishna's instruments to help the world. And he adopted an unusual strategy to save the world. The, the problem was Ravana, this great Asura Ravana, this demonic person who was causing so much trouble in the world. But Ravana had a boon that he could not be killed by a demigod or by any powerful being. And so Ravana was so contemptuous of human beings, he thought they were so weak, puny, that he um, <clears throat> didn't bother asking for a, a, a boon to be immune to or invulnerable against um, human beings. And so Lord Rama came as a human being. This is very interesting because it shows that even Krishna, he just gets the job done. He just does whatever it takes. He uh, he changed his whole status as a living being. I mean, obviously he's still God, but he came as a human being somehow. So that he, he qualified uh, under the terms of the uh, boon that Ravan had received that uh, that he, he did not have any uh, immunity against human beings. So somehow Rama, even though he's God, somehow qualified as a human being. And therefore in the uh, Bhagavatam, first canto, third chapter, the list of incarnations, it said, Deva Twam Apanak, that the Lord assumed, the Lord took on uh, Nara Deva Twam. Nara means man, like Nara Singha, Singha, Nara Singha. So Nara, Deva, a man god, Twam, status of, Nara Deva Twam Apanam, Apana, he assumed. So that's the first thing I wanted to say that Lord Rama was, the Lord was practical, just get the job done, save the world, do what you have to do. And then another point, which I think is very important, is that Lord Rama was always serving others, even though he's God and even though he was you know, important person, even on, in human terms. Uh, he was always serving. For example, Arya Bhachasajadagad Aranya. Uh, the statement is that the Lord went to Aranya, the forest, uh, by the order of his superior, who in this case was his father, Dasharatha. So he went to the forest, Lord Rama went to the forest because he was serving uh, his his father. And then in the forest, he protected Sita and Lakshmana. And then at the request, I believe it was uh, Vasishta, uh, one of the famous sages, uh, Rama killed some demons. He did that because uh, He was asked to do it. It was a service. Again, so he served his father. He was serving his brother and wife. He was serving the sages by killing these rakshasas. And then when Sita was kidnapped and Lord Rama went to a great endeavor to get her back, he was serving his wife. He took very seriously his role as a husband, which meant that he had to protect his wife. So he went, so he again, he was serving his wife and so if you look at his life, throughout his life, he is always serving. His life is a life of service. Even the fact that 
Lord Krishna came as Lord Rama, the very fact that he came as a human being was a service to us. We are talking about Ram right now. We are purifying our existence. We are advancing on our own path of enlightenment by glorifying Rama, by honoring Rama. And so, um, and so he came as a service to us. So this is spiritual life. Spiritual life, if you have a higher position or more power or authority, it simply means you can serve more. And the material notion is that if you have power or authority, you use that to serve yourself, to please your own wishes and whims, to gratify yourself. Spiritual life is exactly the opposite. We use whatever power or authority we have to serve, to help others. So that's the important example of Lord Rama and then another point I wanted to make is that um, to use sort of the modern cliche, Lord Rama did not hesitate to leave his, his quote unquote uh, comfort zone. Of course, Lord Rama was born into a royal family. He was the by primal genitor, which means the firstborn. He was going to inherit his father's kingdom. He lived as they say, on the lap of luxury. He had a, but when it was his duty to go into the forest, he went and didn't hesitate because it was his duty. In obedience to uh, those who were within the context of his pastimes, his authorities. So, so that's Lord Rama's example in a nutshell. I mean, the pastimes you've heard many, many, many times. And, uh, but doing whatever needed to be done to, um, to help the world, coming as a Nara Deva, as a king with the status of a human being, uh, everything he did in his life was to serve others. Everything he did was to serve others. And uh, if that service required him to give up his kingdom, if it required him to go to the forest and live very simply, he was happy to do it. He was happy to do it because he showed the example that one's pleasure should come from service. It's the service. And so if we ourselves adopt that attitude that we go where we have to go, we do what we have to do, so that we can offer the best possible service to Prabhupada and his mission, then we are following the example of Lord Rama. Then we are following Lord Rama's example. Otherwise, clearly we are not completely following his example. And that's what Prabhupada really dreamed of, a society of devotees where everyone is calculating, not as we so often tend to do, I like this, I don't like that, I will, that situation will please me, this other situation will not please me. Uh, we have this terrible habit, which goes back millions of lifetimes. We have this terrible habit of calculating our own self-interest as we perceive it. Of course, Prahlad Maharaj says, Natevi do, they don't know talking about those who are not Krishna conscious. Natevidu sartagatim i Vishnu. Vishnu, that the, there, that one's own true self-interest, that one's own true self-interest can be achieved only by serving the Lord. Na sartagatim i Vishnu, natevidu. So, because people are distracted by their senses. Bahiruttamanya, that people are distracted by their senses and therefore cannot perceive their true self-interest. And so, as I've said before, in the material world, people are not even really very good at being selfish. They're trying to be selfish. They think they are living for themselves, but actually they're not. And so, material life, selfish life, is not even... You can't even be selfish efficiently. 
because in material life, one, no matter what someone thinks they're doing, they're actually acting against their true rational self-interest in terms of their own eternal identity and character. So, um, so Lord Rama comes to, to set this example and the more we were able to follow that example, the, the happier we'll be, the better life we'll have. So, um, let's see, are there any, I may not give a very long class today. I hope I don't get in trouble for that, but um, here we are. And obviously if you're listening to this class, then it's very likely that you are alive at, at present on the earth. So if, if in fact you are alive and on the earth, uh, then uh, then this applies to you. So I just got one. So it said, some people complain about the ending of their own mind, the banishing of Sita. How can we understand it? Yeah, I don't think I've ever met a devotee in my life that really was enthusiastic about that. Um, I think one of the reasons, if you think about it, um, Lord Chaitanya also left his wife, in this case he left and she stayed, um, in Chaitanya Leela. Lord Chaitanya's beautiful wife, who is the goddess of fortune, obviously an expansion of Radharani, and Lord Chaitanya took sannyas. One point which is interesting to think about, because thinking is actually good, most of the time. And that is people, devotees don't complain very much or as much about Lord Chaitanya leaving his wife. It's whereas Lord Rama leaving his wife is, um, I would say, without mean to be offensive, very unpopular among devotees and non-devotees even. No one seems to like that. And so what's the difference? Whereas Lord Chaitanya leaving his wife and and Taking sannyas, it's not that people love that, but they don't complain about it so much. One reason, I think, in the measurably different response of devotees to these two acts of renunciation by the Lord uh, is that the Ramayan is very romantic. And so I think it appeals to us even on a, it appeals to us very strongly on a human level. And it's almost like if you're watching a movie and you love the movie at the very end, oh my God, that's a terrible ending. And it just, it kind of ruins the whole movie for you. And so if you look at Rama, he, precisely because I, I think the fact that we react so much against Lord Rama sending Sita away is connected to uh, the fact that Rama appeared as a human being and that, or in the guise of a human being, and that the story is just so, it's a great human story. It, it's very romantic. When Lord Chaitanya decides he's gonna shave, you know, cut off all his hair, and take sannyas and, and, and go preach in South India, it's wonderful, it's Krishna's pastimes, but it's not, on a human level, it's not gripping the way here you have this beautiful wife, you're sent out to the forest, and even that's romantic. I mean, the fact that Sita insisted on going with Rama, they're living together in the forest, so many travails, he saves her and from that uh, Shurpanaka, Shurpanaka and so on. And then he finally, uh, you know, he builds a bridge to Lanka. This incredible battle takes place. He saves her with this beautiful flower airplane. They fly back to uh, Ayodhya. So it's, I mean, even if, even if Rama wasn't God, 
it would probably be a very popular story. And so I think at a human level, not at a spiritual level necessarily, but at just at a purely human level, we tend to get much more emotionally into the Ram story or we, uh, and, and, I, and I think perhaps more because again, because Rama is acting like a human being, obviously, you know, an incredible human being, like one of the Avengers with superpowers, but still like a human being. And so, you know, as, as, as maybe odd as this may sound, we identify, we can identify more with Rama. When you see Krishna doing all these things, we love it and we relish it. And, but we don't, I think we don't exactly identify with Krishna of lifting over down hill, like I can see myself lifting that hill, or I could still see myself, you know, doing all these other things or expanding into dozens and dozens of forms and dancing with the gopis. We don't really, quote unquote, identify with that. For one thing, because uh, Lord Krishna is, uh, has many girlfriends. And even when he marries, he has many wives. And so, Clearly, we are not on that level. I mean, if, if, if we tried to think of having many, if a man, I should say, tried to think of having many wives, it would not be probably a very uh, recommended state of consciousness for that man to be in. So, so many things about Lord Krishna's pastimes are superhuman. In fact, that's what the Bhagavatam says. Ati Martyani Bhagavan Guda Kapitamanu said that Krishna pretended to be a human, but his activities uh, were Ati Martiani, which means superhuman. Sahara Kritavan, the Bhagavatam first chapter actually says, Kritavan Kilo Karmani Sahara Mena Keshava. Ati Martiani Bhagavan, that Lord Krishna executed so many superhuman pastimes with Balaram. Whereas in the case of Lord Rama, he, of course, is a great fighter, but he acts like a super human. For example, nowadays they have all these movies like from Marvel Comics or DC Comics, you know, the Avengers and all these mutants or Superman. And the interesting thing is that even though they have superpowers, but they're still kind of human. And therefore, that's why people like the story so much, because they can identify with the stories and they can dream if only I was a mutant or something. And, so Rama, in that sense, is probably among the major incarnations of Krishna, the major incarnations. In fact, the, the two great literatures in the Itihasa category, the history category, are Krishna and Rama, Ramchandra. So Ramchandra is a very, very major avatar, and he's the most, perhaps the most human of the avatars, and therefore we most get into the story, not just even, not ex only at a pure spiritual level, but just as like human beings, wow, you know, if I could be a hero like that, or maybe women can fantasize if only there was a man that would rescue me like that and fight the whole world to get to me and rescue me and take me away. So, and so precisely because I think we do get into the story in a way that we don't necessarily get into other avatar stories, at the end, when he sends Sita away, it's like, oh no, it just, because, yeah, it's just the it's people are very unhappy about it. So what do we do with this? I mean, it's even even Lord Chaitanya's time. Some of his devotees were unhappy about it. No one likes it. Even Lord Chaitanya's. I forget some of Lord Chaitanya. Lord Chaitanya was uh, speaking to one of his devotees that said that what about this thing with sending Sita away, or 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 Sita being with Ravan and so on. So. Um, so what do we make of it? If we can pull back our own identification with this pastime for a minute, just like kind of divest ourselves for the moment, detach ourselves from that kind of identification with it and say, this is like Lord Chaitanya. And okay, Rama, Lord Ramchandra went to all this trouble to get Sita. That's the whole power of the story. I mean, I think just one more word about why we're not happy. Um, the whole power of the story, ultimately, of course, there's all kinds of pastimes, but the real story, the central story is fighting Ravana, killing Ravana, and Kumbhakarna, 
and uh, pot ears, by the way, that's his name. Kumba means a pot and Karna means his ear. So he kind of had big pot ears, but anyway. So the whole point is saving Sita and then somehow sending her away. I believe the reason it's disappointing to many people is because if Ram doesn't care that much about Sita, that he's just gonna send her away because one idiot said something, then uh, his rescuing her somehow loses some of its, its value or its emotional power because if he's ready just to send her away in a moment, then maybe he rescued her just because it was his duty. Like, you know, if you're like, if you're a policeman and you go chase a kidnapper, you may not care that much about the kidnapped person, the kidnappee, but it's your duty, it's your job. You know, you're paid to do that. So if Ram Chandra is just doing his job as, as a Kshatriya, it's much less romantic in a sense of kind of, neutralizes all the romantic power of the earlier part of the story. So I'm not saying that should be our final understanding. I'm just trying to analyze psychologically why everyone is, almost everyone is just not happy with that ending. I think another point is that, just trying to be honest and analytic here, that men should protect women and to protect means you give precedence to the women. You know, women go first, not last. It, to protect women doesn't mean to just subjugate them in some crude chauvinist way. So, in fact, in the Bhagavatam, it says that when there was a procession, the women went in front, not in back. In case you're interested, it's in the beginning of the Bhagavatam, first canto, seventh chapter. You can read that. Uh, that... Uh, Strio uh, Purak, you know, that they, they put the women in front and then they went. I think there's also an idea that, well, if somebody has to go, why doesn't Rama go? You know, why send Sita away and make her? Of course, that argument, I think, is not so strong because Ram Chandra, at least in his past time, was unhappy when he sent Sita away and, and really gave, completely gave up sense, gra not sense gratification, completely gave up even normal human pleasures and just basically did fire sacrifices for a very incredibly long period of time. And if you've ever sat at a sacrifice, it's not a lot of fun. I mean, of course, if you really love chanting mantras and you really love throwing ghee in a fire, then I guess maybe it is fun or seeds. But otherwise, you sit there and it's, it's, it's really too hot and there's smoke everywhere and you can hardly breathe and you're just chanting mantras. So it's not, I mean, I can't say it's the most fun thing I've ever done. Although it has its pow pow power, of course, it's a Vedic sacrifice, has its power, but it's not something you do for your own amusement, unless some people actually really love rituals. But So Ram Chandra is not enjoying, he gives up all his own personal worldly happiness, so to speak, in his pastime. So how can we understand it in a way that, excuse me, does not displease us so much? Um, there's the obvious point that Sita and Ram are never really set or separated. Lord Rama was setting an example, but then you could say, well, is that really the example we want to set that if anyone criticizes you, send your wife away and send your children away. Um, I think the most positive way to look at this is that um, there's a sense in which precisely because a man and his wife are united, there's a sense in which, an important sense in which a man and his wife are really a team, they're really united. And so therefore, uh, Lord Rama is showing that he will make the greatest sacrifice. In a sense, if we say that, okay, if Ram can so easily send Sita away, then his fighting for her against Ravana loses value. I think maybe you could do that the opposite way. You could say that, well, when Rama was fighting to save Sita and he couldn't live without Sita, that was real. I mean, in terms of his pastime, that was real. He really does love Sita that much. And therefore, seeing that he's going to give up that which he most loves in the world, that which is most important to him, that which he most loves, his own dear Sita, 
and yet he's letting go of that because he knows that if he doesn't do that, knowing human psychology, knowing how envious people in general are, if he doesn't do that, then it will weaken, perhaps cripple his power to save other people, for them to have faith in him. That's one point. And so, yes, Lord Ram does love Sita that much. The romance in the first part of the story is real. And therefore, Lord Rama's sacrifice is all the more powerful. Um, I think there's another reason why Lord Rama did that, just uh, as I think about it, which is that um, there is a very strong tendency in this world that when people get power, they act selfishly. I mean, we know, anyway, look at the leaders of the world today and uh, yeah, very often they act very selfishly, even if lots of people have to die. Even if they cause the death of so many people, they'll rather, they'll still, they will still pursue their own sense gratification. And so perhaps this is one of the most dramatic possible examples of a king doing just the opposite, giving up that which he most loves, that which he most cherishes, and giving that up for the sake of his people. I mean, it's a very powerful example of how a leader has to be unselfish. Now, one can say, did Rama, did Lord Ramachandra overreact? Did he overreact? I mean, after all, it was one low-class guy that said to his unchaste wife, I'm not like Rama, I'm not going to tolerate this nonsense. So implying that Sita had not been perfectly faithful, which was, of course, most offensive and, and crazy. So I think if Lord Rama had known that it's not going to go past this guy, here's one crazy envious person, so maybe I'll just go and get rid of him or whatever, just tolerate it. If Lord Ramchandra knew that this type of malicious criticism is really confined to, restricted to one crazy man, I don't think he would have sent Sita away, but Lord Rama knew because he understood the, the world he lived in, that it will not stop here. This man will not shut up. He will tell other people, they will tell, tell other people, and it's really going to undermine my whole, um, it's going to undermine my ability to be a good king. So there's a lot at stake here. It's not just one foolish person. So those are some points that occur to me. I think if we put all that together, uh, it may help us to look at the mind in general more positively and not get so disturbed by this act of sending away Sita and, and his sons. So, uh, no more questions. Uh, at least I don't see any more questions, and uh, so I guess I don't see them, they don't exist. Actually, they do exist. Um, Okay, let's actually, I found the comment area. Um, okay, I think that's, at least those are all the questions that have come to me. If you asked a question and it was somehow overlooked, I apologize for that. And if you send it to me directly, I can I can try to answer it. So uh, thank you all very much for your attention. Uh, I wish you all a very happy Ram Navami. Hope you all stay safe during the pandemic. And even after the pandemic, we should all stay safe so that we can continue serving Krishna. And hope you'll We'll all get together again very soon, certainly at the latest by Sunday, Krishna willing. All right, Krishna.